We read now from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ from his Sermon on the Mount, the time when he took the newly called disciples away and he sat them down to teach what are the fundamentals of what he has come to accomplish. I would say this is what you call Discipleship 101 from the fifth chapter of Matthew, the first 12 verses. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My undergraduate degree is in English from Towson University. And in my senior year, my last semester of school, I had a professor beg me to take a seminar course that he was teaching called British Literature of World War I. Yawn. <laughs> he convinced four of us to take the class. Now when you're one of four, you cannot hide and you must do all the reading and there was significant reading. But it was not just a literature course, it was a course in history. But I want to share with you a poem of World War I, and if you know any poem of World War I, you know this one. It is called In Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the lark still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. World War I was called the Great War. What else was it known as? The war to end all wars. A phrase that was coined by H.G. Wells when he wrote about the war. And we have learned sadly since that it was not the war to end all wars. It was the first modern warfare. And that's why they thought it would end all wars, because it was so brutal, because there were trenches and mustard gas, and because so many people survived disfigured for the rest of their lives. It destroyed the British economy, and it destroyed the class system there. But it certainly did not end war for us. But it is the end of World War I, or the supposed end of World War I, that set the day that we know as Veterans Day, known as Remembrance Day in other parts of the world. Because just 15 minutes ago, on the 11th of November at 11 a.m., the war was supposed to end, but it didn't. The fighting continued until the Treaty of Versailles was finally signed and warfare ceased. But so we set aside a day to remember our veterans to celebrate their coming home to us. Because for us, it's not a Remembrance Day as in our Memorial Day. It's to remember the sacrifice that so, one, so many made for their country, so many men and women, and so many people.
people who sacrificed by sending their loved ones to war in fear of never seeing them again. It was World War I where we developed the term shell shock, known now as post-traumatic stress disorder. And while at the earliest days of my ministry, I did know some World War I veterans, now we're at the end of the World War II veterans. Some of you have World War II vets in your family, and some of you have veterans going back to the revolution in your families, if you've studied your genealogy. And one thing I heard repeatedly from the wives, particularly, of those soldiers who went to war, they could not come back and talk about what they had seen. One couple in particular had been married for 70 years, and she said, I just can't understand why he came home and immediately went out with his friends at night. And I tried to explain to her, and she finally seemed to understand that it was because he was a farm boy from Berkeley County, West Virginia, who had never seen what he saw when he was sent to Europe. And he could not bring that home with him and share it with his family. But he felt the need to express what he had seen, and so he would gather again and again with those who knew what it was to go to war. This is a powerful day in the life of our nation. And I think it's a powerful day for us here. I'm going to let you in on something that upsets some people when they hear it. I'm a pacifist. Now, sometimes when I say I'm a pacifist, people interpret that to say I'm not patriotic or to say that I'm anti-military and I am patriotic and I am pro military and I have done my best to work to support those who serve as well as the families that they too often have to leave behind. But what made me a pacifist was some of the passages we read today. Because we have given up hope in peace in the world, we've given up hope that peace could ever prevail on earth, but peace is God's will for humankind. Peace begins within each of us. That's why we started praying for those who are struggling inside themselves. We prayed for peace within our families and within our community because too often we suffer brokenness in our relationships or we judge those who have experienced brokenness in their relationships and we try to second guess why there's divorce or why parents sometimes leave their children in the care of others. And I can't tell you how many times I have changed appointments in the United Methodist Church, either during or right before an election year, which is also the year of general conference. And we have felt the pain in this congregation of realizing that our United Methodist Church may no longer exist as we know it, in just a few months from now when the general conference meets to hear the arguments on how we should divide or whether we should stay together. And in our communities, there is still so much mistrust among neighbors. Within our nation, we have division and you only have to turn on the news to see the division among the nations. And I know a man in my last congregation who was born in Sierra Leone, and he grew to be such a tall, big man that he was going to be conscripted at the age of 17 and forced to go into the army. And so his mother, who was a high-ranking official in the police force of Sierra Leone, got him out of the country to save his life. There are places in the world where mothers fear that what happened to their husbands will happen to their sons. There are people who live around the planet in situations that we can only imagine. And just a few weeks ago, my intern who worked with me for two years in my last congregation said goodbye to his brother as he was deployed to Syria right before all hell broke loose there. There are things in the world that scare us. 
There are things in the world that seem to threaten our very way of life. But yet we have a Savior who calls us to live at peace with one another, to live at peace within our own hearts by trusting God. And when I say there are people living in despair, and I'm not talking about people who suffer from depression, which is an illness. I'm not saying that that is any sort of spiritual or moral failing. But when Christ's people lose hope in his promises, we tend to give way to the way things are instead of claiming the way that things will be through the love of our Savior. And so many times people have said to me, well, Jesus himself said there will always be wars and rumors of wars. Yes, he did say that because he knew human nature so very well. But how many times throughout scripture are we called to the ways of peace? Jesus took his first disciples up that mountainside and he sat them down and he said to them blessed are you when people revile you and hate you and persecute you blessed are you when you grieve blessed are you who are meek blessed are you and they must have been thinking why are we following this guy what is he saying to us blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are those who are struggling why would he say that is blessed because Jesus, from the very day he calls any of us, calls us to reality, to the way the world is, but reminds us that in the power of God, all things are possible. We're getting ready to come up on the season of Advent when we will remember the story of the Annunciation, when the angel appeared to Mary and said to her, you will conceive and bear a son you have to remember that that could have been a death sentence for her because she was unmarried and the law called for her to be stoned. And yet the angel said to her, this is what is going to happen to you. Her only question is, how can that be? And his answer is, with God, nothing is impossible. And so, as God's people, we need to reclaim God's promise of peace. We need to work for peace. We need to be makers of peace. We need to let go of old resentments and hurts. We need to pray for one another. Now, we're in an election year, and people tell me, I don't like the president, or I love the president, or you don't know what you're talking about, or you're crazy, or he doesn't know anything. That's not gonna change anyone's mind or heart. We are called to pray for the leaders of this nation, and I would say if you didn't vote for the leaders of this nation, pray doubly hard because you think they needed twice as much. Pray for them every day. Pray for them to hear the word of God and to respond with all their hearts to do what is best for the people of the world. And if you are carrying a grudge against someone in the name of Jesus Christ, your Savior, let it go. Let it go. Be a person of peace. Make peace. Don't lose heart in what is God's plan for this world. That is for us to love one another and care for one another. And in caring for one another, I want you to care for those who have given their time and their lives and their livelihood to serve our nation and its armed forces. We need to pray for our servicemen and women. We need to pray for their safety we need to support them in any way we can. Back during Desert Storm, a woman in my congregation who had recently left the Army Reserves, she was a nurse, came to me and said she was feeling guilty over leaving. She left when she had a child. She was given that option and she decided to take it and stay home. But she was feeling bad for the company she left behind. She said, is there anything that we can do for the soldiers who are serving abroad? She was going to contact an organization. I said, let's just call up one of our chaplains. So we called one of the chaplains from the Baltimore Washington Conference who was serving in Iraq. He wrote back to us and said, we would love for you to do something for us. 
So what we decided to do was send them some cookies. And he said, well, there are 846 people in this unit. We don't expect you to do something for all of them. But what about the 46 who are at headquarters? And I stood up on Sunday morning to say, let's do something for the, how long could it take us to bake 46 dozen cookies? But I'm telling you, it was not me. It was the Holy Spirit who suddenly said through me, what about the other 800? What about them? I said, how hard could it really be to bake 800 dozen cookies? As I told you, I was an English major. I took one math class in college. It was called Teaching Primary Numbers to Preschoolers, also known as Math for English Majors. But there was an accountant in the congregation who on the back of his bulletin did the math and said, Reverend, that's 11,000 cookies. And I said, well, what's 11,000 cookies among all of us? And so we committed ourselves to baking 11,000 cookies, and we did not reach our goal. We baked 14,000 cookies. From 14,000 cookies, we had people who said, well, you know, my nephew is over there, and he says the food is really lousy. They'd like some hot sauce. So we came up with about 12,000 packets of hot sauce to go with the cookies, not on the cookies, I hope. <laughs> One of my members came to me and said, I work for Chrysler and I talked to my boss and the Chrysler Corporation would like to send two decks of playing cards to every soldier in this unit. They ended up each getting a care package. It cost us about $1,300 to mail them and nobody cared anymore because people decided that once we started listening to what God would have us do, instead of starting with what do we think we can accomplish, that amazing things happened. What happened from there was that we started receiving letters from the soldiers who received our care packages, talking to us about having no family, about joining the military because they had no other choice because they were orphaned or they had taken the wrong way in life and had tried to get back on track. We received a letter from one officer who said, thank you for sending me the first piece of mail I have received in the two years I have been deployed. So please don't think for a moment that I'm not pro-military or unpatriotic. But I have to believe that Jesus Christ and the way of peace is the way the world is intended to be. And I want us each to commit ourselves to praying for peace. Just two weeks ago, I was leading a contemplative photography retreat, and Barry Edwards was there this time and had a good time. And a friend of mine was leading one of the sessions, and in fact, he was preaching that Sunday morning. And he talked about people when they hear an ambulance. How many of you, when you hear an ambulance or a siren, stop and pray? Lots of people do that. I do that every time I hear an ambulance or a siren, I stop and I pray, both for the person who is on the receiving end, but for the people who are on their way to render aid and support. But my friend went on to say, how many times when we see something beautiful like a sunrise or a sunset, or even a leaf on a tree that has turned a brilliant color for fall, how many times do we stop and thank God for the beauty of the earth? I'd like to expand that thought. How many times do we pray, not just on Veterans Day or Memorial Day or the 4th of July, how many times do we pray for those who are serving our nation? We need to do that regularly. And I want to challenge you also to pray for peace every day. The things that Jesus told his disciples didn't seem realistic. To be blessed when you're grieving, to be blessed when people revile you and persecute you. It doesn't feel like it's possible. But in the name of the Prince of Peace, everything is possible. Nothing is impossible for God. Not even peace in ourselves, in our families, in our community, in our nation, and around the world. So this morning, I invite you now to stand and greet your neighbor. I told you a few weeks ago that the handshake started as a way to show that you had no sword or weapon in your hand. 
And I'm going to ask you, if there's somebody here who's tweaked your nerves, perhaps, make a point of going to that person and offering peace and offering wholeness. Because the peace of Jesus Christ comes from the word shalom, a Hebrew concept that it goes beyond the absence of warfare. Shalom means wholeness, completeness in God, well-being, health, happiness. So in the name of Jesus Christ, shalom to you. Shalom to you. And would you greet one another with a sign of that love, that peace, and that commitment.